Hi, my name is Samantha Fell. The court case I'm going to be talking about today is Curtis Publishing Company versus Butts. This was um, a court case that raised questions about the application of the actual malice standard to public figures back in the 60s. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So this court case, um, although in our Canvas modules, it says 1966 or 1967. It actually started way back in 1963. Um, basically, what led up to the case being brought to the Supreme Court was the Saturday Evening Post, which was a magazine owned by Curtis, Publish Curtis Publishing Company, ran an article on March 23rd, 1963, containing allegations that Wally Butts, who was the athletic director, director at the University of Georgia, fixed a football game with Bear Bryant, who is the UA football coach, or was the UA football coach at that time, uh, between the University of Georgia and the University of Alabama. Um, the source for this article was a George Burnett. He was an Atlanta insurance agent, and allegedly he overheard their phone call um, and the conversation about fixing the game. That's how they got the source and the info, and then they published an article in the magazine. Um, quite obviously, both coaches denied any fixation of the football game, and Wally Butts actually decided to sue for defamation. Um, his stance was that he challenged the accuracy of the article and accused the magazine of making a serious departure from the standards of investigation that reporters usually uphold. Um, so this was brought to the district court and he had three main pieces of evidence that he stood on um, during this trial. The first one was that the Post did not interview anyone with Burnett at the time of the phone call. So they had absolutely no other support for Burnett's claim other than what he was claiming no witnesses, nobody else, only Burnett. The second piece of evidence that he stood on was that no one at the Post had checked game plans for adjustment. They didn't go back and watch tapes. Uh, they didn't talk to any players or coaches or anything about what happened during the game or any game plans before or during. Um, they just went with the allegation. And the third and final piece of main evidence was that the writer of the article in the Post was not a football expert and they actually made no attempt to have an expert check the story um, for factual claims and uh, anything like that before publishing. So Butts, uh, because of this evidence and the stance that he took, did win in the district court against Curtis Publishing. Uh, they awarded him $60,000 in compensatory damages and $400,000 in punitive damages um, at this particular trial. Now fast forward a year um, and we get to 1964, there was a Supreme Court case, New York Times versus Sullivan. Now I'm not gonna go into the whole case. Um, there's another student in the class that is discussing that um, as their presentation, but the decision of that case is important to Curtis Curtis Publishing versus Butts later on when it got to the Supreme Court. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Basically, the Supreme Court decision of New York Times versus Sullivan was that public officials in libel cases must show that the statement was made with knowledge that it was false or with reckless disregard of whether it was false or not. That was the decision of the case. After this decision was reached um, and made public and all sorts of stuff like that, Curtis Publishing moved for a new trial. Uh, it was rejected because Butts was not a public official. He was considered a public figure um, or just a general citizen, but not a public official. And it was also rejected because there was enough evidence uh, in the original trial that there was blatant disregard for the truth uh, when the article was originally published. Um, obviously, it got to the Supreme Court, which means that Curtis Publishing appealed it, um, and a Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the decision on the basis that Curtis Publishing had waived constitutional challenges by not bringing up um, what they were bringing up now, the fact that um, or the ruling of New York Times versus Sullivan. They were bringing it up now and not during the trial, 
um, and they decided that because they didn't bring it up in the first place, uh, they just waived that challenge altogether. So uh, obviously it got appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court, and that's what led to the 1967 Supreme Court trial. So before I talk into you know the question of the trial at the Supreme Court level and the ruling of that and everything, I want to mention another uh, case that reached the Supreme Court um, that is relevant to this topic. Um, and the reason I want to talk about it is because it is another case that questioned the application of the ruling of New York Times versus Sullivan, which is what Curtis Publishing versus Butts ended up doing at the Supreme Court. Uh, and the reason I'm going to talk about it is because it's important for understanding the extent of the new ruling uh, that was reached during the Supreme Court trial. So this new case that I'm just going to mention briefly is uh, Associated Press versus Walker. Basically what happened in this was that there were, dis there were dispatch reports of a riot at the University of Mississippi's campus uh, September 30th of 1962. And what was reported that an Edwin A. Walker, who was a private citizen of the U.S. as well as a political activist, led a violent crowd to prevent federal marshals from enforcing court-ordered desegregation uh, at the college campus. Walker did deny this. He filed um, for defamation um, and carried out a libel suit in the state court of Texas. The jury of the court favored Walker. The judge did not award punitive damages because uh, he didn't find any malintent. Um, and stated that New York Times versus Sullivan was inapplicable to that trial. It was appealed. Um, the Texas Court of Civil Appeals agreed with that uh, ruling, and the Texas Supreme Court refused to hear the case. So I just want to give you some background on that because it will be brought up later. So once, going back to Curtis Publishing versus Butts, once it was brought to the Supreme Court case, um, or the Supreme Court, the question of the case and the trial was, did the constitutional safeguards under New York Times versus Sullivan apply to a public figure who is not a public official? The original ruling of New York Times versus Sullivan applied only to public officials, uh, like government employees and things like that. Um, Butts was not a public official. He was a public figure. So did that apply to him? Overall, Yes, the ruling was that public figures can win libel cases under findings of highly unreasonable conduct. Um, Chief Justice Warren actually said that there was no basis in law, logic, or First Amendment policy to differentiate between public officials or public figures, which is why they reached part of why they reached this ruling. There's no real logic or law that differentiates between them. So you can treat them as the same thing. So they did find Butts to be a public figure in the Supreme Court trial. They also ruled that a private citizen could be a public figure if purposeful activities put them in the middle of an important public controversy. This will be kind of important when we uh, discuss AP versus Walker, but for now we'll leave that be until we come back to that. So. The decision was a 5-4 decision in favor of Butts. Uh, they noted significant differences between the cases I've talked about and New York Times versus Sullivan's. Um, basically, criticisms of Butts could not be conflated with criticisms of public po uh, policy because he wasn't a government official. Um, you know, so unlike that of a public official, there wasn't anything like that that could. Um, go hand in hand with criticisms of public policy. So when they reached that 5-4 decision, the Supreme Court justices, they had the majority vote in favor of Butts, but not a unanimous reason as to why they voted that way. So I want to talk about why they voted the way they did. So four justices that we're going to talk about first, um, Justice John Marshall Harlan II, Justice Tom C. Clark, Justice Potter Stewart and Justice A. Fortas all had the same opinion. Uh, they call it the plurality opinion. That was what it's written up as. And basically that was the opinion that public figures who aren't public officials can recover damages for libel coming from false reports based on highly unreasonable conduct constituting an extreme departure from the standards of investigation and reporting ordinarily adhered to by responsible publishers. 
this was basically what butts kind of stood on in the very first trial way back in 1963. Um, they did kind of agree with that. Um, and it carries over from the 63 case to the 67 case at the Supreme Court trial. The fifth vote that did not agree with this reasoning necessarily was that of Chief Justice Earl Warren. While he did agree that Curtis Publishing had libel butts and that there was defamation uh, in occurrence, he believed that actual malice should be appropriate libel standard for public figures. When we look at his reasoning, um, he did believe that actual malice had occurred. And when we look back on evidence, uh, particularly in the 1963 case that Butts brought up in the trial, we can see why he believed this. Um, you know, there was no other witnesses except for the insurance agent, Burnett. There was no fact checking, um, no expert opinion included. It was just really bad reporting uh, pretty much altogether which is why Earl Warren believed that actual malice had occurred. So because of this reasoning, uh, they did decide that Curtis publishing allegations against Butts failed to meet the standards of investigation and reporting that was usually adhered to by publishers and journalists. Uh, normally, they denied a retrial um, and just let the original ruling of the 1963 case uh, continue to be held out. Part of this reasoning was that um, they, the Sunday Evening Post under Curtis Publishing did publish an article with a questionably reliable source, as we've discussed, uh, that did not have verifications of the allegations of the source at all. Um, another reason for this decision was that the story was not a pressing event or incredibly newsworthy. Um, it was about a football game that... It was about a football game um, that honestly didn't have much, you know, public um, impact other than it was a football game. So and I want to bring back up Associated Press versus Walker's case. There was an extent to this ruling that was met or that we can see from the differences between Curtis Publishing and AP versus Walker. The difference is that Associated Press's correspondence at the riot at the event where they got their information from was reporting on the scene of an event that was immediately newsworthy. It was a riot on a college campus over desegregation. Um, the Supreme Court did deny Walker's claims to damages because of this. It wasn't really um, defamation or libelous. Uh, it was reporting on newsworthy events that did happen. So why is this important for journalists today? Why should we pay attention to this court case and uh, look at it and learn from it? Well, as we've talked about in class and as we've seen in the um, facts of this case and uh, what played out in this case, libel cases are super expensive. Um, you know, we talked about some, you know, being in the millions of dollars. Um, and in this case, we saw that Butts earned a total of $460,000, which is a lot of money, uh, especially in today's standards. That's way more than what it would have been back then in the 60s. So they can be really expensive. So it's important that we, as journalists, keep this in mind when we are reporting so that we don't get sued and have to pay bunches and bunches of money for even accidental defamation or libel. Uh, this also extends the reach, this court case and this decision, extends the reach of that New York Times versus Sullivan case to reach public figures as well as public officials. Um, as we talked about before, uh, Chief Justice Warren, you know, basically said there was no way in law or logic or First Amendment or anything that differentiated public officials and public figures. They're basically the same and we can consider them the same in court cases. So it's important to be careful because now we have a wider um, target, I guess, for lack of a better term, that could sue for defamation. You know, we have not only government officials 
and you know public officials, but we have people like celebrities or football coaches or you know college chancellors. Anyone in the public eye can sue for libel and can win damages because of that. And again, as we talk about libel cases, can be really expensive. Uh, a lot of times, as we talked about before, you know, juries can be biased against the media, and the media often will lose. And so we don't want to, one, that looks bad on reporting, and two, we lose money as well. And in losing money, it can shut down um, publications, it can shut down companies, it can shut down newspapers and magazines. This particular case actually did shut down, um, or kind of started the shutdown of the Sunday Evening Post, and from that, Curtis Publishing Company. They are no longer around, and it was very shortly after this that that happened. And because you know we could lose so much money, and it could look bad on our name, that's why we want to be careful and pay attention to cases like these, so we understand that, hey, our range of you know who is considered eligible to sue for libel and who is considered eligible to win suits um, of libel and defamation is important. That is the court case. Um, I'm sure if there are any questions, um, there, I think there will be a discussion board that Dr. Serafin is going to post. Um, but you guys are welcome to you know, ask any sort of questions. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, thank you for listening. I hope you learned something.